Good morning, everyone. My name is George Gray Molina. I'll be joining our team at UNDP uh, with Eduardo Ortiz, uh, with Maria Jose Abud, Alberto Castañon on this course for fiscal microsimulation. Uh, what we wanted to do in the very first session was to uh, tell the story of how we got here and think about the use of this tool for uh, looking at fiscal incidents and also achieving fiscal space for the SDG agenda. So I'll talk about multidimensional progress and what we'll, what I'll focus on is some unresolved issues uh, on the agenda um, of multidimensional progress. Okay, the starting point for most of our work on Agenda 2030 is to think about uh, the SDG agenda not as a gap by gap uh, issue, but rather to think about it as clustering of issues that are interrelated. So those clusters we call combos or, or clusters of interrelated, integrated uh, problems. Um, we can look at many scorecards. This is the scorecard presented by the SDGindex.org um, presented at the high-level political forum in, in, during the summer of 2017. Uh, but you can, you can take a look at a number of these uh, that are national-based or regional-based, uh, ECLAC, DESA, as well as each, uh, each country that has their own way of tallying this and taking a look at it. Uh, our approach is to think of this the, sort of the challenge of addressing the SDG agenda in terms of combos and clusters. What is a combo? An example would be something like citizen security, which involves education, youth employment, uh, urban infrastructure, as well as work on changing behavior. So we'll have a combo, uh, a set of interventions over a certain territory um, that will be integrated and will be accumulated over time. Rather than focusing on these gap by gap, we'll do it together and we'll sweep through either a parish, a community, a municipality uh, in a way that makes sense as a whole rather than the pieces of the whole. The same could be said about uh, a poverty, a multidimensional poverty approach, which would look at basic sanitation, electricity, access uh, to Internet, access to nutrition, access to health services and education. Uh, we would look at that as a basket of issues uh, from a household perspective. Uh, the same uh, example could be given by teenage pregnancy or by child malnutrition, as we think of these as baskets of interrelated challenges uh, that we need to address at the territorial level. So looking back at the, at the past 15 years, uh, our region, of course, is very heterogeneous, many different rhythms of growth that resulted in different patterns of social, uh, political, environmental change. So we'll take a look at some of the some issues that uh, in the region that we have not been able to address, even in the best of years, even with high levels of economic growth, and that remain on the agenda today. And then I'll focus a bit on this uh, difference of gaps and commons. So pending issues. One of the one of the key things. This is 2017 right now. The latest data from the IMF and also from ECLAC are telling us about uh, three velocity regions. So we have. Um, relatively low growth happening right now in South America. We have a higher rate of growth in Central America and Mexico, and we have sort of a medium range of growth between 2 and 3% in the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, these rhythms of growth are attached to uh, different flows and exchanges with the United States, both on tourism, remittances, as well as foreign direct investment. Um, let me move to the next slide. The important thing on our agenda is to think about how this impacts uh, the income pyramid in each country. Uh, at UNDP, we did an exercise a couple of years ago of, of building these pyramids for each country in the region. Uh, this is the pooled data for all of Latin America. And what, what it tells is a simple story. It tells a story of change over time. Uh, two things are happening over the past 15 years. One is uh, a, a, a rapid reduction of poverty, about 72 million people exiting poverty between 2003 and 2013. Uh, and then we have a number of people joining the middle classes, which is the blue uh, strata there. So that's about 94 million people joining the, the middle class. These, uh, these levels or strata that you see here are based on international comparisons of uh, purchasing parity. So it's $4 a day is the pink line, the yellow line is at $10 a day, and the blue line is at 
$50 a day. So you, you get a sense of where the pyramid lies in, in, in the region. Our focus at the United Nations, and particularly at UNDP, is to look at three things here. One is that there still is a pending issue of multidimensional poverty in most countries. So we focus on that those multiple dimensions and, and build a strategy with the government on, on how to move people out of poverty. Our, our second focus is thinking specifically about the labor markets and about income-based poverty. We want to create a strategy of not falling back into poverty. Many people moving out, but what we've seen over the past four years in the region is close to between 25 and 30 million people who have fell back into poverty despite uh, this the, the very good trend of, of the past decade. So that's about one in three people uh, who had left poverty and fell back in. And then finally, what we call hard exclusions, which is a focus on gender-based discrimination, uh, racial, ethnic uh, migration, or condition of disability. Issues that we have seen that do not change from strata to strata. So you could be in the middle class, you could be vulnerable, you could be poor, but you still have a wage gap between men and women. And this holds for just about every country in our region. So we think we need to address these issues in a different way, not just with regular uh, more of the same labor or social protection policy, but rather anti-discrimination norms and ways of flagging those issues. Okay, so let me focus very briefly on uh, what we've learned over the past few years on each of these. I think the key thing for us on, on the falling back into poverty, on income-based poverty, is to think of it as a dynamic. People are going, are exiting poverty and people are falling back in. This is happening year to year in each country, so that when we see the aggregate data, when we see that 49% of the population has upward mobility, and we see that 13% of the population experiences downward mobility, well, what that's saying is that when, when 1 million people exit poverty, actually what's happening is it's more like 1.2 million people exiting poverty, and maybe 200 uh, or 250,000 people uh, falling back into poverty. So the net is what we usually perceive and we see uh, from the World Bank data, from the IDB data, and also from the ECLAC data. But we would like to focus not on the net data, but on the number of people exiting and the number of people falling back in. As you can see, the, the, there's differences in the region. Some countries doing very well on the exiting part. Some people doing well on the falling back in part. We do some econometric work uh, that we presented in, in the previous training, which is called POV Risk. Uh, and, and in that work, what we find is that the determinants of exit are different from the determinants of not falling back in. And the determinants of exit are very closely aligned to labor market uh, dynamics and to access to education. Uh, and that continues to be true in, in our data and our analysis around the region. But what we do find that is a bit surprising is that once we control for, for labor market dynamics, we find four other indicators that are statistically significant for people uh, preventing people not falling back into poverty. And uh, the first of these is access to physical and financial assets, which is goods, being an owner of your motorcycle, of your apartment, or of your cell phone. And what we find is that access to, to physical assets usually translates to access to financial assets. And this becomes critical in a moment in which we see turbulence and economic growth or the need to, um, to cushion a shock. Second is access to social protection, and we've seen this through conditional cash transfers, through uh, employment insurance, uh, we've seen this through pensions, and the access to social protection creates a, an extra layer um, during a shock. Third, it's more related to the labor market and, and of female labor participation, is access or absence of systems of care. And we see this coming up through the demographic uh, uh, data that tell us that one additional person above the age of 65 or one additional person, a baby uh, or, or toddler, makes a difference in terms of uh, the probability of falling back into poverty. What that's telling us is not so much a population question, but it's, it's a question of social policy, of the lack uh, or access to systems of care. Uh, the fourth issue that we look at is employment the quality of employment, formal, informal, high-skilled, low-skilled, and that, it's, that seems to be the fourth element that explains uh, resilience under a shock. So let me move to some of the more uh, other analysis of multidimensional poverty. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the statistics, but one of the things that we have learned over the past few years, particularly the past decade, is that there is a revolution 
uh, happening right now uh, that is data-based. And in the past, we used to use census data, and then we used to use household data, and maybe a demographic survey every five years, a household survey every two years, census data probably once every 10 years. And of course, there was a big lag, and it was very hard to follow the trends of, of poverty and inequality reduction with data that becomes available every five years. And so many countries started using administrative registries or uh, uh, sort of uh, single beneficiary registries that allow us to track uh, people who are under the poverty line or, or close to it in vulnerability in real time. So we have countries that have millions of records of people and starting to build a panel of data that we, we did not have before. Um, this allows us to do to make a, a quantitative leap on the capacity not just to target interventions, but to follow and monitor them and take a look at tailoring the issues needed for each household. So the example I've got here is in any city block, in any parish, in any community, you will find a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of differences between households. So one household might have a labor-based issue, another household might need uh, special attention on, on health issues, another household might be uh, exposed to risks at, uh, for youth, uh, thinking about violence and youth uh, employment. So we have many characteristics and we're not quite there yet at the capacity to attend these different characteristics. Um, but with administrative registries, with real-time data, which is georeferenced, we can start to address this in a way that is much more com comprehensive. Uh, the, the second, the third thing that we focus on and the third lesson that we've learned is about hard exclusions, those, those gaps that I talked about before that do not change uh, despite economic or social mobility. And what we've learned is that these issues need to be dealt with uh, uh, head first. So anti-discrimination policies, collective rights recognition policies, and even positive discrimination policies or affirmative action policies have been quite effective in the region for different issues. I guess the, the key thing that we've learned is that more of the same on labor policy, on social protection policy, or even just on economic growth, doesn't really make a dent on these hard exclusions that are based on race, based on, on gender, based on ethnicity. So we need to move more aggressively on, on visualizing these, on, on, on showing uh, how this plays out. Uh, one particular issue that we, we, we need to talk about is, is violence. Uh, which violence against women and also violence uh, in general, citizen security, which is an issue that uh, has been resilient to changes over time. A recent study from the World Bank for Laura Chioda uh, shows uh, an interesting correlation between a spike in, in homicide um, coinciding with the period in which we have the highest rise in middle classes in most of the countries in the region. Okay, so let me talk very briefly about what our approach is. At UNDP, we focus on if you will, three combos, three baskets of issues uh, from a multidimensional perspective. So first of all, we look at multidimensional poverty, which is self-explanatory. We look at some of the, the issues that have to do with uh, that, that, that sort of rights-based threshold. Uh, but we also look at higher level threshold issues, things that are structural transformations, either of the environment, of our capacity to de-risk development, of our capacity uh, to build low carbon pathways of sustainable development. Uh, and then we focus on resilience, on the effects of natural hazards, climate mitigation, uh, vulnerabilities uh, that come from hurricanes, from earthquakes, and from our exposure to, to natural hazards. Um, so those three combos, if you will, or clusters, is what the UNDP is focusing on right now. Uh, finally, let you, I'll just walk you through quickly what our approach is, as I explained at the very first slide, is we think that the, the SDG agenda is, is valued because it's comprehensive, because it's integrative, but the important thing for us is to think about how to manage this. If we were to go work gap by gap, we would have to have 169 policies, we would have to have sort of 17 sectoral types of interventions. And we think that's, that's probably not what's going to happen. That's probably not how it happens in day-to-day -day policymaking. But rather, what we see is a clustering of issues that are interrelated and seeking to, to find some accelerators. So this whole combo idea is just an agenda of acceleration, thinking about the two or three issues in your country in which you would like to get out of the red and move into the green, uh, which means uh, moving from uh, some very 
uh, poor indicators either on teenage pregnancy, on violence, on multidimensional poverty into something um, that is that is led uh, that that has better uh, well-being and outcome indicators. So the, the next three slides are just the distinction between this silo-based, gap-based approach and the cluster-based approach. The gap-based approach, of course, on problem definition depends on each ministry defining their own problem. But rather, in the cluster approach, what we try to do is we try to think about a territory, a parish, a community, and start from there, from the bottom up, as you will, and think about then, so what are the issues that are affecting this 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 uh, district? Uh, what are the age groups that are affected? Um, what sort of interventions already exist in public policy? And what, what do we need to do to make these policies work? Most of the time, we already have policies in place that are simply just not reaching the, the, the right people or are not as effective as we thought we were at the design process. So this iterative process of thinking uh, what is working, what's not working, is, is the very first uh, insight into how we work on clusters. The second issue that we think is very important is to think about the, the data sources and, and use this opportunity to integrate and create uh, a single dashboard that will use hopefully administrative data, but also uh, statistical data from, from census and household surveys. We already know that the, the gap-based approach is very silo-oriented, very fragmented. Uh, very frequently in the countries that we visit, uh, ministries don't talk to each other in terms of data sets, even on the protocol of data sets. So we have, we've had issues over the past decade on this. So the, using big data, using information technologies, thinking about it, Geo-referenced uh, administrative registries has been a big uh, jump for most countries. So we think that's that's sort of the wave of the future, how to create a united dashboard. And then finally, the issue that we'll be looking at in this study, in this course, is fiscal space. And we'll be thinking about how fiscal incidence analysis that looks at transfers, that looks at subsidies, and look, looks at taxes all together to estimate post-fiscal incidents is a key is a key element in understanding how to create fiscal space in our country. Because what's what's happening already is that we have multiple interventions, multiple transfers, subsidies, and taxes already affecting households. So we need to get a grip on what that terrain looks like and then do some micro simulation work that will allow us to see changes in subsidies, changes in taxes, changes in transfers over poor and vulnerable populations to see what the distributive um, impact of that is. So again, that's uh, that's a big difference with respect to how we used to do things, which is each ministry would just do their own thing, maybe have their own cost effectiveness internally, but we wouldn't look at how, how it looked like from the point of view of households, which is uh, what we're trying to do in, in this agenda. Um, just to wrap things up, we have many tools. Uh, We've sort of shared some of these tools with you in, in, in previous classes. We looked at POV risk and the risk of falling back into poverty. We looked at the combo approach and clustering um, uh, sort of SDG issues. And now we'll be looking at uh, fiscal space and micro simulations. Um, back to this is how we sort of see our own work on this. We have different, different entry points on the SDG agenda, some with uh, alignment between national development plans and SDGs, some with the combos that accelerate impact on the ground, thinking about territorial interventions. And then we have a path of risk, which is more analytical, that looks at factors of, of risk um, for different uh, shocks affecting poverty and vulnerability. And then we've got the, the fiscal toolkit that, that focuses on fiscal micro simulations uh, and looking for, for space for, the, uh, for Agenda 2030. So I'll wrap it up here. I'll, I'll pass it on to my colleagues who will be uh, working with you over the next few weeks on micro fiscal micro simulations. We're very happy to join you. And uh, I'll be, I'll be p coming in and out uh, over the next few weeks, uh, explaining and some, hopefully threading through some of the, the thorny issues um, on the micro simulation front. So thank you very, thank you very much.